Act One of Theestes by Lucius Aeneas Seneca, translated by Frank Justice Miller. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae, narrator read by Christine Rutger. Theestes read by Joseph S. Brother of Atreus, in exile from his fatherland. The Ghost of Tantalus. Read by Alan Mapstone. Doomed for his sins to come back to earth and inspire his house to greater sin. The Fury. Read by Ahsan Ahmed Mehdi. Who drives the ghost on to do his allotted part. Atreus. Read by Beeswax Candle. King of Argos, grandson of Tantalus, who has quarreled with his brother and driven him into exile. An attendant of Atreus. Read by Alicia. Three sons of Thyestes, only one of whom, Tantalus, takes part in the dialogue. Read by Damien. A messenger. Read by Gino Orsini. Chorus. Read by Agnes Robert Bear. Citizens of Mycenae. The scene is laid partly without the city of Argos and partly within the royal palace. Pelops, the son of Tantalus, had banished his sons for the murder of their half-brother, Chrysippus, with a curse upon them, that they and their posterity might perish by each other's hands. Upon the death of Pelops, Atreus returned and took possession of his father's throne. Thiestes also claimed the throne and sought to gain it by the foulest means, for he seduced his brother's wife, Aerope, and stole by her assistance the magical golden-fleeced ram from Atreus's flocks, upon the possession of which the right to rule was said to rest. For this act he was banished by the king. But Atreus has long been meditating a more complete revenge upon his brother, and now in pretended friendship has recalled him from banishment, offering him a place beside himself upon the throne, that thus he may have Thyestes entirely in his power. Act One: The Ghost of Tantalus who, from the accursed regions of the dead, hath haled me forth, where greedily I strive to snatch the food that ever doth escape my hungry lips? Who now to Tantalus doth show those heavenly seats which once before I saw to my undoing? Can it be that some more fearful suffering than thirst in sight of water, worse than gaping want, hath been devised? Must I the slippery stone of Sisyphus upon my shoulders bear? Must I be stretched upon the whirling wheel, or suffer Titius's pangs, who, lying prone within a huge recess, the gruesome birds doth with his quivering, torn-out vitals feed? By night renewing what the day hath lost, he lies an undiminished feast for all. For what new evil am I now reserved? O oh, thou grim judge of shades, whoe'er thou art, Who to the dead doth meet new punishments, If thou canst still some suffering devise, Whereat grim Cerberus himself would quake, And gloomy Acheron be seized with fear, At whose dread sight e'en I would tremble sore, Seek such a punishment, for from my seed is sprung a race which shall their house outvie in sin, shall make me innocent appear, and dare to do what I have never dared. 
whatever space within the impious realms remains unoccupied my house shall fill while lives the race of pelops on the earth no rest shall minus know the fury thou cursed shade be gone and to the verge of madness drive thine impious house be drawn to the deadly sword to every crime upraised by every hand of angry passions let there be no end no shame of strife let blinded furies sting prick on their souls seared by the breath of rage may parents hearts grow hard and endless crime to children's children drag its impious trail no time be given to hate their former crimes but let the new in quick succession rise not one alone in each and may their crimes e'en while they suffer punishment increase let the throne fall from the haughty brother's grasp and call them back from exiled wanderings let the tottered fortune of this bloody house amid its changing kings in ruins fall bring him of high estate to wretchedness the wretched race and let the king toss upon the seething tide of circumstance by crime driven out when god shall bring them home may they return but to steal other crimes and by all men as by themselves be loathed let nothing be which wrath deems unallowed let brother brother fear and parent child let son fear father let the children die an evil death by doubly evil birth be born let wives against their husband lift their murderous hands let wars pass over seas and every land be drenched with streams of blood triumphant over the mighty kings of earth let lust exult and in thy sinful house let vile incestuous deeds seem trivial let injustice faith fraternal amity be trampled under foot and of our sins let not the heavens themselves escape the taint why gleam the constellations in the sky and flash their wonted glories to the world be pitchy black the night and let the day fall fainting from the heavens and be no more embroil thy household gods rouse murderous hate and all the palace fill with tantalus adorn the lofty columns let the doors with pardoned laurel decked proclaim their joy let torches gleam in celebration meet of thy return then let the thracian crime be done again but triply hideous why stays the uncle's hand in idleness not yet thyestes weeps his murdered sons when will he act the kettle over the fire should even now be boiled severed limbs be broken up the father's hearts be stained with children's blood the festal table spread but at no untried carnival of crime wilt thou sit down as guest this day be free and sate thy hunger at that festal board go eat thy fill and drink the blood and wine commingled in thy sight a banquet this which thou thyself wouldst look in horror on but stay thee whither dost thou rush away back to my pools and streams and ebbing waves back to that tree whose ever mocking fruit eludes my lips oh let me seek again the gloomy couch of my old prison house and if too little wretched i appear bid me my river change within thy stream o phlegethon hemmed round with waves of fire let me be left to suffer ye who e'er by fate decrees are doomed to punishment who e'er thou art who neath the hollowed cave doth lie in constant fear lest even now the cavern's mass shall fall upon thy head whoever fears the gaping greedy jaws of lions and in helpless horror looks upon the advancing fury's cruel lines 
who e'er half burned their threatening torches shuns oh listen to the voice of tantalus far speeding to your realm believe the words of one who knows and love your punishment but now oh when shall it be mine to flee this upper world first must thou plunge thy house in dire disorders stir up deadly feuds awake the kings to evil lust for blood and rouse the wild amaze their maddened hearts tis fit that i should suffer not bestow the punishment but thou wouldst have me go like deadly vapour from the riven earth or like the plague among the people spread and lead my grandsons into crime most foul o oh, mighty sire of gods my sire as well although tis shame to thee to own me son though cruel tortures seize my tattling tongue i will not hold my peace he cries aloud as to his family i warn ye all stain not your kindred hands with sacred blood and with no madman's gifts pollute the shrines lo here i stand and shall avert the deed to the fury why dost thou fright me with thy brandished scourge and shake thy writhing serpents in my face why in mine inmost marrow dost thou rouse these gnawing hunger pangs my very heart is parched with burning thirst and leaping flames dart scorching through my vitals o oh, desist i yield me to thy will then fix this thirst this maddening thirst in all thy kindred hair so e'en as thou may they be driven on the quench their thirst each in other's blood but lo thy house perceives thy near approach and shrinks in horror from thy loathsome touch but now enough do thou go back again to thine infernal caves and accustomed streams for here the sad earth groans beneath thy feet dost thou not see how driven far within the waters flee their springs how river banks are empty and fiery winds drives on the scattered clouds the trees grow sickly pale their branches hang denuded of their fruits and where but late the isthmus echoes back the loud resounding waters near at hand their neighboring waves by but a narrow span dividing now have all the waves withdrawn far seaward and their voice is faintly heard upon the shore now lirna backward strings the streams of incas have hidden away the scared alpheus sends his waters forth no longer and cithirion lifts no more its hoary head for all its snows are gone while they who dwell in noble argos fear their ancient thirst again e'en titan's self stands doubtful whether he shall beat his steeds run their accustomed course and bring the day for doomed by thee to perish on the way they vanish chorus if any god for argos cares and pisa's realms for chariots famed if any loves the ithmian state of corinth with its doubled ports and two opposing seas if any joys in the far-seen snows of mount tagetus which lie heaped on his loftiest peaks what time the wintry blast of boreas blow but which the summer melts again when breathe the soft etesian winds sail filling if the alpheus bright with its cool clear stream moves any god far famed for its olympic course let him his peaceful godhead turn to our affairs let him avert this dread inheritance of crime forbid that in his grandsire's steps the grandson follow worse than he and let not worse monstrosities please generations yet to be oh may at last the impious race 
of thirsty tantalus go o'er in utter weariness its lust for savage deeds enough of sin no longer does the right prevail and wrong is general behold as Myrtilus his lord betrayed he too was treacherously slain for by that self-same broken faith which he had shown himself o'ercome he fell into the sea and changed its name for his amidst the ships that sailed the ionian sea no tale is better known see now all runs the little son to meet his father's kiss he falls by that accursed sword transfixed untimely victim at thy hearth and carved o oh, tantalus by thee that so thou mightest grace the board of friendly gods that in pious feast eternal hunger eternal thirst rewarded penalty more fit for such a crime could not be found see where with gaping throat forspent stands tantalus above his head hang many luscious fruits but swift as phineas birds they flee his grasp on every side the tree droops low with heavy laden boughs o'erweighed by its own fruit and mockingly sways to his straining lips yet he though with impatient longing filled has often mocked so often fails to grasp the prize he turns away his longing gaze strains close his lips and grimly bars his hunger fast behind his teeth but still again the whole grove lets its riches down and flaunts them in his face soft fruits on drooping boughs and wets once more his hunger bidding stretch again his hands but all in vain for now when it has lured him on to hope and mocked its fill the boughs recede and the whole ripe harvest of the wood is snatched far out of reach then comes a raging thirst more fierce than hunger which inflames his blood, and with its parching fires burns up its moisture. There the poor wretch stands, striving to quaff the nearby waves, but the fleeting waters whirl away, and leave but the empty bed to him, who seeks to follow. Quick he quaffs at that swift stream, but to drink the dust. End of Act One Act Two of Theistes by Lucius Aeneas Seneca, translated by Frank Justice Miller. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two Atreus in Soliloquy. O oh, soul, so sluggish, spiritless, and weak, and what in kings I deem the last reproach, still unavenged. After so many crimes, thy brother's treacheries, and every law of nature set at naught, can vent thy wrath in vain and meaningless complaints? By now the whole wide world should be astir with arms, thy arms, and on both seas thy ships of war should swarm. The fields and towns should be ablaze, and gleaming swords should everywhere be seen. Beneath our charging squadrons, thundering tread, let Greece resound. Let this my enemy within no forest's depth a hiding find. No citadel upon the mountain heights shall shelter him. Let all the citizens, my Mycenae leaving, sound the trump of war. Whoe'er grants refuge to that cursed head shall die a dreadful death. This noble pile, the home of our illustrious Pelops line, I would might fall on me, if only thus it might destroy my hated brother too. But come, my soul, to what no coming age shall e'er approve, or e'er forget, some deed must be attempted, impious, bloody, dire, such as my brother's self might claim as his. No crimes avenged saved by a greater crime. But where the crime that can surpass his deeds? Is he yet crushed in spirit? 
Does he show in prosperous circumstances self-control, contentment and defeat? Full well I know his tameless spirit. It can ne'er be bent, but can be broken. Then, before his force he strengthens and opposing powers prepares, we must the attack begin, lest, while we wait, he strike us unprepared. For well I know that he must either slay me, or be slain by me. There lies the crime between us two. Who leaps to grasp it first, the crime shall do. Attendant. But does evil fame of such a deed deter you not? The greatest blessing, this, of royal power, that men are forced to praise their monarch's deeds as well as bear them. Yea, but those whose praise is forced by fear become by that same fear in turn the bitterest foes. But he who seeks the people's heartfelt praise will wish their hearts and not their tongues to speak. True praise may often fall to humble men, but false alone to kings. Let subjects learn to want what they would not. Let monarchs learn to choose the right, then all will choose the same. When kings are forced to choose the right alone, their rule is insecure. Where is no shame, no thought of righteousness, no piety, no faith, no purity? Oh, then indeed that rule is insecure. That purity, faith, piety are private virtues all. With kings, their will is law. O oh, count it wrong to harm thy brother, though he basest be. Whatever may not lawfully be done to brothers, may with perfect right be done to him. What is there left me now unstained by crime of his? Where has he failed to sin? My wife he has debauched, my kingdom stolen the ancient emblem of our dynasty by fraud obtained, and all our royal house by that same fraud and dire confusion plunged. There is a flock within our royal stalls, rich fleeced and nobly bred, and with the flock a ram, their leader, wondrous, magical. For from his body thickly hangs a fleece of fine-spun gold, with which the new crowned kings of Pelops' line are wont to adorn their sceptres. Who owns the ram is king, for with his fate the fortunes of our noble house are linked. This sacred ram in safety feeds apart within a mead whose fateful bounds are fenced by stony walls and kept with gate of stone. Him greatly daring did my brother steal perfidious, with my wife in secret league of crime. And this has been the fountain spring of all my woes. Throughout my kingdom's length have I, a trembling exile, wandered long, and found no place of safety from his snares. My wife has he defiled, my subjects' faith and loyalty destroyed, my house o'erthrown. All ties of kinship broken, and nothing left of which I may be sure, save only this, my brother's enmity. Why do I stand in stupid inactivity? At length, bestir thyself, and gird thy courage up. Think thou on Pelops and on Tantalus. Such deeds as theirs must by my hands be done. To attendant. Tell me then how vengeance may be won. Drive out his hostile spirit with the sword. Thou speakest of the end of punishment, but I the punishment itself desire. Let easy going rulers slay their foes. In my domain, death is a longed for boon. Oh, do pious motives stir thee not at all? Away, O oh piety, if ever thou didst dwell within my house, and in thy stead let come dire fury's cohorts, fiends at war, Megaira holding high in either hand her flaming torch, for with a mighty rage tis not enough my heart should be inflamed, I fain would be by greater horrors filled. What new design does thy mad soul conceive? 
no deed within the accustomed bounds of grief. I'll leave no crime undone, and yet no crime is bad enough for me. Wilt use the sword? Tis not enough. The flames? Still not enough. What weapon, then, will thy mad passion use? Thy est is self. Far worse than madness, this. I do confess it. Deep within my heart a fearful tumult rages unrestrained, and I am hurried on I know not where. I only know that I am hurried on. From lowest depths a moaning sound is heard, and thunders rumble in the cloudless skies. A crashing noise resounds throughout the house as though twere rent in twain. Upon my hearth the frightened Lares turn their gaze from me. Yet this shall be, this awful thing shall be, ye gods, which ye do fear to think upon. What then is this which thou dost meditate? Some greater evil lurks within my soul, and monstrous swells beyond all human bounds, my sluggish hands impelling to the deed. I know not what it is, but this I know, that tis some monstrous deed. So let it be. Haste thee, and do this deed, O soul of mine. Tis worthy of Thyestes, and of me. Let both perform it then. The Odrysian house was wont to look on feasts unspeakable. Monstrous thing, tis true, but long ago performed. This grief of mine some greater sin must find to feed upon. Do thou inspire my heart, O Dorley and Procne, who didst know a mother's and a sister's feeling too? Our cause is similar. Assist thou then and nerve my hand to act. Let once again a sire with joyous greed his children rend and hungrily devour their flesh. Tis good. Tis quite enough. This mode of punishment so far doth please me well. But where is he? Why do the hands of Atreus rest so long inactive? Even now, before mine eyes, the perfect image of the slaughter comes. I seem to see the murdered children heaped before their father's face. O oh, timid soul, why dost thou fear? Why droops thy courage now before the deed is done? Then up and dare. Of this mad crime the most revolting part thy estes self shall do. But by what while shall we unto our snares entice his feet? For he doth count us all his enemies. He never could be taken were his will not bent on taking too. E now he hopes to take my kingdom from me. In this hope he'll rush against the bolts of threatening Jove. This hope will make him brave the whirlpool's wrath and sail within the treacherous Libyan shoals. On this hope stayed, the greatest ill of all will he have strength to bear. The sight of me. But who will give him confidence and peace? To whom will he such weighty credence give? His wicked hope is ready to believe. Yet shall my sons this message bear from me. Now let the wretched exile roam no more, but leave his homeless state for royal halls, and rule at Argos, sharer of my throne. But if Thyestes harshly spurned my prayer, his guileless children, overspent with woes and easily beguiled, will bend his will unto their prayers. His ancient thirst for power, together with his present poverty, and harsh demands of toil will move the man, however stubborn, by their weight of woes. But time by now has made his troubles light. Nay, sense of wrong increases day by day. Tis easy to bear hardship for a time, but to endure it long, an irksome task. Choose other servants for thy grim design. Young men lend ready ear to base commands. Beware, lest what against their uncle now thou teachest them. They turn against their sire in time to come. Full oft do crimes recoil upon the man who instigates them. 
Though none should teach them fraud and ways of crime, the throne itself would teach them. Dost thou fear lest they grow evil? Evil they were born. What thou dost savage, cruel, call in me? Dost seem impossible and impious? Perchance my brother even now doth plot against myself. Shall then thy children know what crime they do? Not so. For youthful years cannot keep silent faith. They might perchance betray the trick. The art of secrecy is mastered only by the ills of life. And wilt thou then deceive the very ones through whom thou plantest another to deceive? That so they may themselves be free from guilt. For what the need of implicating them in crimes of mine? Nay, through my acts alone my hate shall work its ends. But hold my soul, thou dost ill. Thou shrinkest from the task. If thou dost spare thine own, thou sparest his as well. So then let Agamemnon be the conscious minister of my designs, and wittingly let Menelaus help his father's plans. And by this test of crime, let their uncertain birth be put to proof, if they refuse to wage this deadly war, and will not serve my hatred. If they plead, he is their uncle. Then is he their sire? So let them go. But no. The look of fear has oft revealed the heart. In weighty plans, e'en gainst the stoutest will betray themselves. They shall not know of how great consequence their mission is. To attendant. And do thou hide it too. No warning do I need. For in my breast it shall be hid by fear and loyalty. But more shall loyalty prevail with me. Chorus. At last our royal family, the race of ancient Inachus, hath quelled the brothers' deadly strife. What fatal madness drives you on, to shed by turns each other's blood, and gain the throne through paths of crime? O ye who lust for regal state, ye know not where true power is found, for riches cannot make a king nor Tyrian garments richly dyed, nor royal crowns upon the brow, nor portals glittering with gold. But he is king who knows no fear, whose heart is free from mad desires, whom vain ambition moveth not, nor fickle favor of the mob. The hidden treasures of the rest move not his heart, nor sands of gold, which take us waters sweep along within their shining bed nor yet the garnered wealth of grain, trod out on Libyan threshing floors. He fears no hurtling thunderbolt, in zigzag course athwart the sky, no Eurus ruffling up the sea, nor the heaving Adriatic's waves, wind-swept and mad before the blast. No hostile spear nor keen bare sword can master him, but set on high, in calm serenity he sees, all things of earth beneath his feet, and so with joy he goes to meet his fate and welcomes death. In vain against him would kings contend, though from all lands they congregate, they who the scattered Dacians lead, who dwell upon the Red Sea's marge, whose depths are set with gleaming pearls, or who, secure on Caspian heights, Leave all unclosed their mountain ways against the bold summations. They who through Danube's swelling waves dare make their way with fearless feet, and wheresoever they dwell despoil the famed and far off Syrians. In vain all these, for tis the soul that makes the king. He needs no arms, no steeds, no ineffectual darts, such as the Parthian hurls from far in simulated flight for him. No engine huge with far-hurled rocks, they waste the hostile city's walls. But he is king who knows no fear, and he is king who has no lust, and on his throne secure he sits, who is self-crowned by conscious worth. Let him who will in pride of power upon the brink of empire stand, for me be sweet repose enough, in humble station fixed would I, my life in gentle leisure spend, in silence, 
all unknown to fame. So when my days have passed away, from noisy, restless turmoil free, may I, in meek obscurity, and full of years, decline in death. But death lies heavily on him, who, though to all the world well known, is stranger to himself alone. End of Act Two Act Three of Theestis by Lucius Aeneas Seneca Translated by Frank Justice Miller. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act 3. Enter Theestes, returning from banishment, accompanied by his three sons. At last do I behold the welcome roofs of this my fatherland the teeming wealth of Argos, and the greatest and best of sights to weary exiles. Here I see my native soil and my ancestral gods, if gods indeed there be. And there, behold the sacred towers by hand of Cyclops reared, in beauty far excelling human art. The race course, thronged with youth, where oftentimes have I within my father's chariot sped on to victory and fair renown. Now will all Argos come to welcome me. The thronging folk will come, and Atreus too. Oh, ho, 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 ho. better far reseek thy wooded haunts, thy glades remote and mingled with the brutes. Live even as they why should this splendid realm with its fair seeming glitter blind my eyes when thou dost look upon the goodly gift scan well the giver too of late i lived with bold and joyous spirit though my lot all men considered hard to bear but now my heart is filled with fears my courage fails, and bent on flight, my feet unwilling move. Tantalus, one of Thiestes' sons. Why, O oh my father, dost thou falter so? With steps uncertain, turn away thy face, and hold thyself as on a doubtful course. Thiestes, in soliloquy. Why hesitate? My soul, or why so long deliberate upon a point so clear? To such uncertain things... Dost thou entrust thyself as throne and brother? And fearest thou those ills already conquered and found mild? Dost flee those cares which thou hast well bestowed? Oh, now my former wretchedness is joy. Turn back while still thou mayest, and save thyself. What cause, O oh father, forced thee to leave thy native land at last regained? Why now, when richest gifts are falling into thy lap, dost turn away? Thy brother's wrath is o'er, and he has turned himself once more to thee, has given thee back thy share of sovereignty, restored our shattered house to harmony, and made thee master of thyself again. Thou askest why I fear. I cannot tell. No cause for fear I see, but still I fear. I long to go, and yet my trembling limbs go on with faltering steps, and I am born where I most stoutly struggle not to go. So when a ship by oar and sail is driven, the tide, resisting both, bears it away. But thou must overcome whatever it be that doth oppose and hold thy soul in check, and see how great rewards await thee here. Thou canst be king. Since I have power to die. But royal power is- Not, if only thou no power dost covet. Leave it to thy sons. No realm on earth can stand divided power. Should he who can be happy still be sad? Believe me, son, tis by their lying names that things seem great, while others harsh appear, which are not truly so. 
When high in power I stood, I never ceased to be in fear. Yea, even did I fear the very sword upon my thigh. Oh, what a boon it is to be at feud with none, to eat one's bread without a trace of care upon the ground. Crime enters, not the poor man's humble cot, and all in safety may one take his food from slender boards, for tis in cups of gold that poison lurks. I speak what I do know. Ill fortune is to be preferred to good, for since my palace does not threatening stand in pride upon some lofty mountain top, the people fear me not. My towering roofs gleam not with ivory, nor do I need a watchful guard to keep me while I sleep. I do not fish with fleets, nor drive the sea with massive dikes back from its natural shore. I do not gorge me at the world's expense. For me, no fields remote are harvested beyond the Gete and the Parthians. No incense burns for me, nor are my shrines adorned in impious neglect of Jove. No forests wave upon my battlements, no vast pools steam for my delight. My days are not to slumber given, nor do I spend the livelong night in drunken revelry. No one feels fear of me. And so my home, though all unguarded, is from danger free. For poverty alone may be at peace. And this I hold. The mightiest king is he who from the lust of sovereignty is free. But if some god a kingdom should bestow, it is not meet for mortals to refuse. Behold, Thy brother bids thee to the throne. He bids. Tis but a cloak for treachery. But brotherly regard oft times return unto the heart from which it has been driven, and righteous love regains its former strength. And dost thou speak of brother's love to me? Sooner shall ocean bathe the heavenly bears, the raging waves of Sicily be still, and sooner shall the Ionian waters yield ripe fields of grain, black night illume the earth, and fire shall mate with water, life with death, and wind shall make a treaty with the sea, then shall Thyestes know a brother's love. What treachery dost thou fear? All treachery. What proper limit shall I give my fear? My brother's power is boundless as his hate. How can he harm thee? For myself alone I have no fears, but tis for you, my sons, that Atreus must be held in fear by me. But canst thou be overcome if on thy guard? Too late one guards when in the midst of ills. But let us on. In this one thing I show my fatherhood. I do not lead to ill, but follow you. If well we heed our ways, God will protect us. Come with courage on. Atreus, coming upon the scene, sees Thyestes and his three sons and gloats over the fact that his brother is at last in his power. He speaks aside. Now is the prey fast caught within my toils. I see the father and his hated brood, and here my vengeful hate is safe bestowed. For now at last he's come into my hands. He's come. Thyestes and his children, all. When I see him, I scarce can curb my grief and keep my soul from breaking badly forth. So when the Umbrian hound pursues the prey, keen-scented on the long leash held, he goes, with lowered muzzle questing on the trail. While distant still the game and faint the scent, obedient to the leash, with silent tongue he goes along. 
when the prey is near, restraining neck, he struggles to be free, bays loud against the cautious hunter's check, and bursts from all restraint. When, near at hand, hot wrath perceives the blood for which it thirsts, it cannot be restrained. Yet must it be. See how his unkempt, matted hair conceals his woeful countenance. How foul his beard. He now addresses Thyestes. My promised faith, my brother, will I keep. Tis a delight to see thee once again. Come to my arms in mutual embrace, for all the anger which I felt for thee has melted clean away. From this time forth let ties of blood be cherished, love and faith. And let that hatred which has cursed us both forever vanish from our kindred souls. I should attempt to palliate my sins, hadst thou not shown me such fraternal love. But now I owe, my brother, now I owe that I have sinned against thee past belief. Thy faithful piety has made my case seem blacker still. A double sinner, he who sins against a brother such as thou. Now let my tears my penance approve. Thou, first of all mankind, beholdest me a suppliant. These hands, which never yet have touched the feet of man, are laid on thine. Let all thy wrathful feeling be forgot, be utterly erased from off thy soul, and take, O oh brother, as my pledge of faith, these guiltless sons of mine. Lay not thy hands upon my knees, come rather to my arms. And you, dear youths, the comforters of age, come, cling about my neck. Those rags of woe, my brother, lay aside and spare mine eyes, and clothe thyself more fittingly in these, the equal of mine own. And last of all, accept thine equal share of this our realm. Twill bring a greater meed of praise to me to restore thee safely to thy father's throne. Perchance may put the sceptre in our hands. But only virtue seeks to give it up. May heaven, my brother, worthily repay these deeds of thine. But this my wretched head will not consent to wear a diadem, nor my ill-omened hands to hold the staff of power. Nay, rather, let me hide myself among the throng. There's room upon the throne. But I shall know that all of thine is mine. But who would throw away good fortune's gifts? Whoe'er has found how easily they fare. And wouldst thou thwart thy brother's great renown? Thy glory is attained. Mine bides its time. My mind is resolute to shun the crown. Then I refuse my share of power as well. Nay, then. I yield. The name of king I'll wear, but laws and arms and I are thine to sway. Atreus, placing the crown on his brother's head. I'll place this crown upon thy reverend head, and pay the destined victims to the gods. Chorus. The sight is past belief. Behold, this Atreus, fierce and bold of soul, my every cruel passion swayed, when first he saw his brother's face, was held in dumb amaze. No force is greater than the power of nature's ties of love. Tis true that wars with foreign foes endure, but they whom true love once has bound will ever feel its ties. When wrath, by some great cause aroused, hath burst the bonds of amity and raised the dreadful cry of war, when gleaming squadrons thunder down with champing steeds, when flashing swords by carnage maddened Mars upreared gleam with a deadly rain of blows, e'en then, for sacred piety, those warring hands will sheathe the sword and join in the clasp of peace. What God has given this sudden lull 
in the midst of loud alarms. But now, throughout Mycenae's borders rang the noisy prelude of a strife. Twixt brothers' arms, here mothers pale, embraced their sons, and the trembling wife looked on her armed lord in fear. When the sword to his hand reluctant came, foul with the rust of peace, one strove to renew the tottering walls, and one to strengthen the shattered towers, and close the gates with iron bars, while on the battle minster guard, his anxious nightly vigils keep, the daily fear of war is worse than war itself. But fallen now are the sword's dire threats, the deep voice trumpet blare is still, and the shrill harsh notes of the clarion are heard no more, while peace profound broods once again o'er the happy state. So when beneath the storm blast lash, the heaving waves break on the shore, of brutium and still of roars, responsive from her cavern's depths, that even within their sheltered port the sailors fear the foaming sea, which greedy Charybdis vomits up, and Cyclops dreads his father's rage when he sits on burning Etna's crag, lest the deathless flames on his roaring forge be quenched by the overwhelming floods. When poor Laertes feels the shock of reeling Ithaca, and thinks that his island realm will be swallowed up, then, if the fierce winds die away, the waves sink back in their quiet depths, and the sea, which of late the vessels feared, now far and wide with swelling sails, is o'erspread, while tiny skiffs skim safely o'er its harmless breast, and one may count the very fish, deep down within the peaceful caves, where but now, beneath the raging blast, the battered islands feared the sea, no lot endureth long, for grief and pleasure, each in turn depart. But pleasure has a briefer reign, from lowest to the highest state, a fleeting hour may bring us. He, who wears a crown upon his brow, to whom the trembling nations kneel, before whose nod the barbarous Medes lay down their arms, the Indians too, who dwell beneath the nearest sun, and Dacians, who the Parthian horse, are ever threatening. He, the king, with anxious mind the scepter bears, foresees and fears the fickle chance, and shifting time, which soon or late, shall all his power o'erthrow, yet whom the ruler of the land and sea has given o'er subject men the fearful power of life and death. A major overweening pride, for whatsoever fear of you, your weaker subjects feel today. Tomorrow shall a stronger lord inspire in you, for every power is subject to a greater power. He whom the dawning day beholds, in proud estate the setting sun, sees lying in the dust. Let no one then trust o'ermuch to favoring fate, and when she frowns, let no one utterly despair of better fortune yet to come, for Clotho mingles good and ill. She whirls the wheel of fate around, nor suffers it to stand. To no one are the gods so good that he may safely call his own tomorrow's dawn, for on the whirling wheel has God our fortunes placed for good or ill. End of Act Three Act Four of Theestes by Lucius Aeneas Seneca, translated by Frank Justice Miller. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four. Enter messenger breathlessly announcing the horror which has just been enacted behind the scenes. Messenger. Oh, for some raging blast to carry me with headlong speed through distant realms of air, and wrap me in the darkness of the clouds, that so I might this monstrous horror tear from my remembrance. Oh, thou house of shame, to Pelops even, and to Tantalus. Chorus. What is the news thou bringest? What realm is this? Argos and Sparta, once the noble home of pious brothers? 
Corinth on whose shores to rival oceans beat? Or do I see the barbarous Danube on whose frozen stream the savage Alani makes swift retreat? Hikania beneath the Turner's nose? Or those wide plains of wandering Scythians? What place is this that knows such hideous crime? But tell thy tidings, whatsoe'er they be. When I my scattered senses gather up, and horrid fear lets go its numbing hold upon my limbs, oh, but I see it still the ghastly picture of that dreadful deed. O oh, come, ye whirlwinds wild, and bear me far, far distant, where the vanished day is born. Thou holdest our minds in dire uncertainty. Speak out, and tell us what this horror is, and who its author. Yet would I inquire, not who, but which he is. Speak quickly, then. There is upon the lofty citadel a part of Pelops's house that fronts the south, whose farther side lifts up its massive walls to mountain heights. For so the reigning king may better sway the town, and hold in check the common rabble when it scorns the throne. Within this palace is a gleaming hole so huge it may a multitude contain, whose golden architraves are higher borne by stately columns of a varied hue. Behind this public hall where people throng, the palace stretches off in spacious rooms, and deep withdrawn the royal sanctum lies, far from the vulgar gaze. This sacred spot the nation grow within a dale confines, wherein no tree its cheerful shade affords, or by the knife is pruned. But cypress trees and yews and woods of gloomy ilex wave their melancholy boughs. Above them all a towering oak looks down and spreads abroad, o'ershadowing all the grove. Within this place the royal sons of Tantalus are wont to ask consent of heaven to their rule, and here to seek its aid when fortune frowns. Here hung their consecrated offerings, sonorous trumpets, broken chariots, those famous spoils of the Myrtuan sea, still hung upon the treacherous axle trees the conquered chariot wheels, mementos grim of every crime this sinful race has done. Here also is the Phrygian turban hung of Pelops's self, and here the spoil of foes, a rich and brighter robe, the prize of war. An oozy stream springs there beneath the shade, and sluggish creeps along within the swamp, just like the ugly waters of the Styx, which bind the oaths of heaven. Tis said that here, at dead of night, the hellish gods make moan, and all the grove resounds with clanking chains, and more full howl of ghosts. Here may be seen whatever, but to hear of, causes fear. The spirits of the ancient dead come forth, from old, decaying tombs, and walk abroad, while monsters, greater than the world has known, go leaping round, grotesque and terrible. The whole wood gleams with an uncanny light, and without sign of fire the palace glows. Of times the grow re-echoes with the sound of threefold banes of the dogs of hell, and oft do mighty shapes affright the house. Nor are these fears allayed by light of day, for night reigns ever here, and in at noon the horror of the underworld abides. From this dread spot a sure response is given to those who seek the oracle. The fates with mighty sound from out the grot are told, and all the cavern thunders with the god. It was to this spot that Madden Atreus came, his brother's children dragging in his train. The sacrificial altars are adorned. <sighs> who can worthily describe the deed? Behind their backs the noble captives' hands are bound, and purple fillets wreathe their brows. All things are ready, incense, sacred wine, the sacrificial meal, and fatal knife. The last detail is properly observed, that this outrageous murder may be done in strict observance of the ritual. Who lays his hand unto the fatal steel? He is himself the priest. The baleful prayer he makes, and chants the sacrificial song with wild and boisterous words. Before the shrine he takes his place, 
The victim's doom to death he sets in order, and prepares the sword. He gives the closest heed to all details, and misses no least portion of the right. The grove begins to tremble, earth to quake, and all the palace totters with a shock, and seems to hesitate in conscious doubt where it shall throw its ponderous masses down. High on the left, the star with duckling train should swift athwart the sky. The sacred wine poured at the altar's fires, with horrid change, turns bloody as it flows. The royal crown fell twice, and yet again from Atreus's head, and the ivory statues in the temple wept. These monstrous portents moved all others so, but Atreus only held himself unmoved, and even said the threatening gods had not. And now, delays at an end, he stands before the shrine with lowering, silent gaze, as in the jungle by the Ganges stream a hungry tiger stands between two bulls, eager for both, but yet in doubtful mood, which first shall fill her fangs. To this she turns, with gaping jaws, then back to that again, and holds her raging hunger in suspense. So cruel Atreus eyes the victims doomed to sate his cursed wrath, and hesitates. Who first shall feel the knife, and who shall die the next in order? Tis of no concern, but still he hesitates, and gloats a while in planning how to do the horrid deed. Who then is the first to die? First place he gives, lest you should think him lacking in respect, and to his grandsire's namesake, Tantalus. What spirit, what demeanor showed the youth? He stood quite unconcerned, not strove to plead, knowing such prayer were vain. But in his neck that savage butcher plunged his gleaming sword, clear to the hilt, and drew it forth again. Still stood the corpse upright, and, wavering long, as dwelt in doubt or here or there to fall, at last prone on the ankle, hurled himself. Then he, his rancor unabated still, dragged youthful Plythinus before the shrine, and quickly met it him his brother's fate. With one keen blow he smote him on the neck, whereat his bleeding body fell to earth, while with a murmuring articulate his head with look complaining rolled away. What did he then, this twofold murder done, the last one spare, or heap up crime on crime? As when some man a lion in the woods victorious attacks, the Armenian herds, his jaws are smeared with blood, his hunger gone, and yet he does not lay aside his wrath. Now here, now there, he charges on the bulls, and now the calves he worries, though his teeth are weary with their work. So Atreus raves, he swells with wrath, and grasping in his hand a sword with double slaughter dripping yet, by fury blinded but with deadly stroke, he drives clean through the body of the boy, and so, from breast to back transfixed, he falls by double wound, and with his streaming blood extinguishes the baleful altar fires. Oh, horrid deed! What horrid call ye that? If only there the cause of crime had stopped, would pious sim. What more atrocious crime? What greater sin could human heart conceive? And do you think his crime was ended here? It was just begun. What further could there be? But shan't he through the corpses to be torn by raving beast, and kept them from the fire? Would that he had? I do not pray for this, that friendly earth may give them burial of funeral fires consume, but only this, that as a ghastly meal they may be thrown to birds and savage beasts. Such is my prayer which otherwise were a direful punishment. Oh, that the father might their corpses see denied to sepulture. Oh, crime of crimes, incredible in any age, a crime which coming generations will refuse to hear. Behold, from breasts yet warm with life, the extra plucked away, like quivering, the lungs still breathe, the timid heart still beats, but he the organs with a practised hand turns deftly over, and inquires the fates, observing carefully the viscera. 
With this inspection satisfied at length, with mind at ease, he now is free to plan his brother's awful feast. With his own hand the bodies he dismembers, cubbing off the arms and shoulders, laying bare the bones, and all with savage joy. He only saves the heads and hands, those hands which he himself had clasped in friendly faith. Some of the flesh is placed on spits and by the roasting fires hangs dripping. Other parts into a pot are thrown, where on the water's seething stream they leap about. The fire in horror shrinks from the polluting touch of such a feast, recoils upon the shuddering altar hearth twice and again until at last constrained, though with repugnance strong it fiercely burns. The liver sputters strangely on the spits, nor could I say whether the flesh or flames grow more. The fitful flames die out in smoke of pitchy blackness, and the smoke itself, a heavy mournful cloud, mounts not aloft in upward shooting columns, straight and high, but settles down like a disfiguring shroud upon the very statues of the gods. O all-enduring sun, though thou didst flee in horror from the sight, and the radiant noon didst into darkness plunge, twas all too late, the father tears his sons, and impiously feasts on his own flesh. See, there in state he sits, his hair anointed with a dripping nard, his senses dulled with wine, and off the food, as if in horror held, sticks in his throat. In this thine evil hour one good remains, one only, O Thiestes, that to know thy death of suffering is spared to thee, but even this will perish, though the sun should turn his chariot backward on its course, and night at noon arising from the earth should quite obscure this foul and ghastly crime with shades and known it could not be concealed, for every evil deed shall be revealed. Unnatural darkness has come over the world at midday. O oh, Father of the earth and sky, before whose rising beams the night, with all her glories flees away, O oh, whither dost thou turn thy course? And why, midway of heaven, does day to darkness turn? O oh, Phoebus, why dost turn away thy shining face? Not yet has evening's messenger called forth the nightly stars, not yet the rounding of thy western goal, bids loose thy horses from their toil, not yet as day fades into night, sounds forth the trumpet's evening call, the ploughman stands in dumb amaze, with oxen still unspent with toil, to see the welcome supper hour, so quickly come, but what, O son, has driven thee from thy heavenly course? What cause from their accustomed way has turned thy steeds? His war said, once more by giants bursting forth from out the riven gates of Dis. This tide he hopes, though wounded sore, renew his ancient deadly wrath. Perchance thy foe use has thrown off his mountain and is free once more. Perchance once more away to heaven, those giants felled in Flegra's vale are building, and on Pelion's top, are piling Thracian also high, the accustomed changes of the heavens, are gone to come no more, no more, the rising and the setting sun, shall we behold, aurora bright, the herald of the dewy morn, who is wont it is to speed the sun, upon his way, now stands amazed, to see her kingdom overturned, she is not skilled to bathe his steeds, a weary with their rapid course, nor in the cooling sea to plunge their reeking manes. The sun himself, in setting, sees the place of dawn, and bids the darkness fill the sky. Without the aid of night, no stars come out, nor do the heavens gleam with any fires. No moon dispels the darkness black and heavy pall. Oh, that the night itself were here, whatever this portends, our hearts are trembling, yea, are trembling sore, and smitten with a boding fear, lest all the world in ruins fall, and formless chaos as of yore, o'erwhelm us, gods and men, 
less land, and all encircling sea and stars, that wander in the spangled heavens, be buried in the general doom, no more with gleaming deathless torch, till Phoebus, lord of all the stars, lead the procession of the years, and mark the seasons, never more. Shall Luna, flashing back his rays, dispel the fears of night and pass, and shorter course her brother's car, the throng of heavenly beings soon, shall in one vast abyss be heaped, that shining path of sacred stars, which cuts obliquely thwart the zones, the standard bearer of the years, shall see the stars in rune fall, itself in rune falling, he, the ram, when the early spring restores the sail to the warming breeze, shall headlong plunge into those waves, through which the trembling maid of Greece he bore of old, and Taurus, who, upon his horns like a garland wears, the Hyades shall drag with him the sacred twins and the stretched out claws of the curving crab with heat inflamed, our city's lion once again, shall fall from heaven, the virgin too, back to the earth she left shall fall, and the righteous scales with their mighty weights shall drag in their fall the scorpion, and he, old Chiron, skilled to hold upon his bow of Thessaly, the feathered dart shall loose his shafts and break his bow, cold Capricorn, who usher sluggish winter in, shall fall from heaven and break thy urn, where thou art, O water-man, and with thee shall the fish depart, remotest of the stars of heaven, and those monsters huge which never yet were in the ocean plunged, shall soon, within the all-engulfing sea, be swallowed up, and that huge snake, which like a winding river glides, between the bears, shall fall from heaven, united with that serpent huge, the lesser bear, congealed with cold, and that slow driver of the wane, no longer stable in its course, shall all in common ruin fall. Have we of all the race of men been worthy deemed to be overwhelmed and buried neath a riven earth? Is this our age the end of all? Alas, an evil hour of fate, were we begotten wretched still, whether the sun is lost to us, are banished by our impious sins, but away with vain complaints and fear, eager for life is he who would not die, though all the world in death around him lie. End of Act 4 Act 5 of Theestes by Lucius Aeneas Seneca Translated by Frank Justice Miller this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act 5. Atreus entering exultantly. The peer of stars I move high over all, and with exalted head attain the heavens. Now are the reins of power within my hands, and I am master of my father's throne. I here renounce the gods, for I have gained the height of my desires. It is enough, and even I am satisfied. But why? Nay, rather will I finish my revenge and glut the father with his feast of death. The day has fled, this shame should hold me back. Act then, while yet the darkness fails the sky. Oh, that I might restrain the fleeing gods and force them to behold the avenging feast. But tis enough, if but the father sees. Though daylight aid me not, yet will I snatch the shrouding darkness from thy miseries. Too long with carefree, cheerful countenance thou liest at the feast. Now food enough and wine enough, for so great ills as these, Thyestes must his sober senses keep. To the slaves. Ye menial throng, 
Spread wide the temple doors, the festal hall reveal. Tis sweet to note the father's frantic grief when first he sees his children's gory heads, to catch his words, to watch his colour change, to see him sit all breathless at the shock in dumb amaze, in frozen horror at the gruesome sight. Tis the sweet reward of all my toil, to see his misery, e'en as it grows upon his soul. The doors are thrown open, showing Thiestes at the banquet table. Now gleams with many a torch the spacious banquet hall. See, there he lies upon his golden couch, all richly decked with tapestry, his wine-befuddled head upstayed upon his hand. Oh, happy me! The mightiest of the heavenly gods am I and king of kings. The fondest of my hopes is more than realised. His meal is done. Now raises he his silver cup to drink. Spare not the wine. There still remains the blood of thy three sons and will be well disguised with old red wine. Now be the revel done. Now let the father drink the mingled blood of his own offspring. Mine he would have drunk. But see, he starts to sing a festal song, with mind uncertain and with senses dim. Thiestes sits alone at the banquet table, half overcome with wine. He tries to sing and be gay, but in spite of this, some vague premonition of evil weighs upon his spirit. O oh, heart, long dulled with wretchedness, put by at last thine anxious cares. O oh, now let grief and fear depart, let haunting hunger flee away. The grim companion of the lot of trembling exiles, And disgrace a heavy load for mourning souls. More boots it from what height thou fallest than what depth. How noble is't when fallen from the pinnacle With dauntless step and firm to tread the lowly plain and noble too, though by a mass of cares o'erwhelmed, to bolster up the shattered throne with neck unbending, and with soul heroic, undismayed by ills, to stand erect beneath the weight of ruined fortunes. But away! Ye gloomy clouds of fate, ye marks of former misery, depart! Thy happy fortune greet with face of joy, and utterly forget the old Thyestes. But alas, this fault is linked with wretchedness, that never can the woeful soul accept returned prosperity. Though kindly fortune smile again, he who has suffered finds it hard to give himself to joy. But why dost thou restrain me? Why forbid to celebrate this festal day? Why wouldst thou have me weep, O grief, for no cause rising? Why, with flowers, dost thou forbid to wreath my hair. It does, it, it does forbid, for see, upon my head the flowers of spring have withered, and my festal locks, though dripping with the precious nard, stand up in sudden dread. My cheeks, that have no cause to weep, are wet with tears, and in the midst of speech I groan aloud. No doubt tis true that grief well trained in weeping loves to melt away in tears, and 
Oft the wretched feel a strong desire to weep their fill. And so I long to cry aloud my wretchedness, to rend these gorgeous Tyrian robes and shriek my misery to heaven. My mind gives intimation dark of coming grief, its own distress foreboding. So the sailor fears the raging tempest's near approach when tranquil waters heave and swell without a breath of wind. <laughs> the fool! What grief! What rising storm of fate dost thou imagine nigh? Nay, nay, believe thy brother, for thy fear tis groundless whatsoever it be. For thou dost fear too late. Ah, oh, me, I would not be unhappy now. But in my soul dim terror stalks, nor can my eyes withhold their tears. And all for naught, what can it be? Am I possessed by grief or fear? Or can this some great rapture be that weeps for joy? Atreus greeting his brother with effusive affection. With one consent, my brother, let us keep this festal day. For this, the happy day which shall the scepter established in thy hand and link our family in the bonds of peace. Thiestes pushing the remains of the feast from him. Enough of food and wine. One thing alone can swell my generous sum of happiness, if with my children I may share my joy. Believe that in the father's bosom rest the sons, both now and ever shall they be with thee. No single part of these thy sons shall e'er be taken from thee. Make request. What thou desirest will I freely give, and fill thee with thy loving family. Thou shalt be satisfied. Be not afraid. E'en now thy children mingled with my own, enjoy alone their youthful festival. They shall be summoned hither. Now behold this ancient cup, an heirloom of our house. Take thou, and drink the wine which it contains. He hands Thiestes the cup filled with mingled blood and wine. I take my brother's proffered gift, but first Unto our fathers' gods we'll pour a share, and then we'll drink the cup. But what is this? My hands will not obey my will. The cup, how heavy it has grown, how it resists my grasp. And see how now the wine itself, though lifted to my mouth, avoids the touch and flees my disappointed lips. Behold, the table totters on the trembling floor, the lights burn dim, the very air is thick, and by the natural fires deserted stands all dull and lifeless, twixt the day and night. What can it all portend? Now more and more the shattered heavens seem tottering to their fall. The darkness deepens, and the gloomy night in blacker night is plunged, and all the stars have disappeared. Whatever this may mean, oh, spare my children, brother, spare, I pray, and let this gathering storm of evil burst upon my head. Oh, give me back my sons. Yes, I will give them back, and never more shall they be taken from thy fond embrace. Exit. What is this tumult rising in my breast? Why do my vitals quake? I feel a load unbearable, and from my inmost heart come groans of agony that are not mine. My children, come! Your wretched father calls. Oh, come, for when mine Eyes, behold you here, perchance this care will pass away. But whence 
those answering calls. Atreus, returning with a covered platter in his hands. Ah, spread thy loving arms. See, here they are. He uncovers the platter, revealing the severed heads of Theestes' sons. Dost recognize thy sons? I recognize my brother. How, O oh Earth, canst thou endure such monstrous crime as this? Why? Dost thou not to everlasting shade and Styx infernal cleave a yawning gulf and sweep away to empty nothingness this guilty king with all his realm? And why dost thou not raise and utterly destroy the city of Mycenae? Both of us should stand with Tantalus in punishment. If far below the depths of Tartarus there is a deeper hell, O Mother Earth, thy strong foundations rend asunder wide and send us hither to that lowest pit. There let us hide beneath all Acheron, let damaged shades above our guilty heads go wandering. Let fiery Phlegathon in raging torrent pour his burning sands above our place of exile. But the earth insensate lies, and Utterly unmoved. The gods have fled. Nay, come with thankful heart. Receive thy sons whom thou hast long desired. Enjoy them. Kiss them. Share among the three thy fond embraces. And is this thy bond? Is this thy grace? Thy fond fraternal faith? So dost thou cease to hate? I do not ask that I may have my sons again unharmed, but what in crime and hatred may be given. This I, a brother, from a brother ask, that I may bury them. Restore my sons, and thou shalt see their corpse burned at once. The father begs for naught that he may keep, but utterly destroy. Thou hast thy sons, whate'er of them remains. Thou also hast whate'er does not remain. What hast thou done? Hast fed them to the savage greedy birds? Have beasts of prey devoured their tender flesh? Thou hast thyself that impious banquet made. Oh, then, t'was this that shamed the gods of heaven, and drove the day in horror back to dawn. Oh, me, what cries shall voice, what plaints express my wretchedness? Where can I find the words that can describe my woe? The severed heads and hands and mangled feet are there, for these their sire, for all his greed, could not devour. But, oh, I feel within my vitals now that horrid thing which struggles to be free but can no exit find. Give me the sword which even now is reeking with my blood that it may set my children free from me. Thou wilt not give it me? Then let my breast resound with crushing blows, but hold thy hand, unhappy one, and spare the imprisoned shades. Oh, who has ever seen such crime as this? What dwellers on the rough and hostile crags of Caucasus or Procrustes dire, the terror of the land of Attica, 
Lo, I, the Father, overwhelm my sons, and by those very sons am overwhelmed. Is there no limit to this crime of thine? When one for its own sake commits a crime, there is a proper limit. But no end is possible when vengeance through the crime is sought. E'en as it is, this deed of mine is all too mild. I should have poured their blood straight from their gaping wounds into thy mouth, that thou mightst drink their very streams of life. But there my wrath was cheated of its due by overhaste. I smote them with the sword. I slaughtered them before the sacred shrine, and with their blood appeased our household gods. I hewed their lifeless bodies limb from limb. I carved them into bits, in part I seethed in brazen kettles, part before the fire on spits I roasted. From their living limbs I carved the tender flesh, and saw it hiss and sputter on the slender spit. The while with my own hands I kept the fire ablaze. But all these things the father should have done. In this my vengeful grief has fallen short. With impious teeth he tore his slaughtered sons, But still in merciful unconsciousness The deed was done and suffered. O oh, ye seas, hemmed round by curving shores, Give ear to this, hear to ye gods, Wherever ye have fled, ye lords of Hades, hear, hear, O ye lands, and night all black and heavy with the pall of Tartarus. Attend unto my cry, for I am left to thee, and thou alone dost look in pity on my wretchedness. Thou too, forsaken of the friendly stars, for I will raise no wicked prayers to thee, not for myself implore. What could I ask? For you, ye heavenly gods, be all my prayers. O thou, almighty ruler of the sky, who sitst as lord upon the throne of heaven, enwrap the universe in dismal clouds, incite the wind to war on every side and let thy thunders crash from pole to pole not with such lesser bolts as thou dost use against the guiltless homes of common men but those which overthrew the triple mass of heaped up mountains and those giant forms themselves like mountains huge, such arms employ, hurl down such fires, avenge the banished day. With thy consuming flames supply the light which has been snatched from out the darkened heaven. Select us both as objects of thy wrath, or, if not both, then me. Aim thou at me with that three-forked bolt of thine, transfix my guilty breast, if I would give my sons to burning and to fitting burial, I must myself be burned. But if my prayers do not with heaven prevail, and if no god aims at the impious his fatal shaft, then may eternal night brood o'er the earth, and hide these boundless crimes in endless shade. If thou, O sun, dost to thy purpose hold, and cease to shine, I supplicate no more. Now do I praise my handiwork indeed. Now have I gained the palm of victory. My deed had failed entirely of its aim. Didst thou not suffer thus? Now may I trust that those I call my sons are truly so, and faith that once my marriage bed was pure has come again. What was my children's sin? Because they were thy children. But to think that children to the father... That indeed, I do confess, it gives me greatest joy, that thou art well assured... 
They were thy sons. I call upon the gods of innocence. Why not upon the gods of marriage call? Why dost thou seek to punish crime with crime? Well do I know the cause of thy complaint, because I have forestalled thee in the deed. Thou grievest, not because thou hast consumed this horrid feast, but that thou wast not first to set it forth. This was thy fell intent, to arrange a feast like this unknown to me, and with their mother's aid attack my sons, and with a like destruction lay them low. But this one thing opposed, thou thought'st them thine. The gods will grant me vengeance. Unto them do I entrust thy fitting penalty. And to thy sons do I deliver thee. End of Act 5 End of Theestes by Lucius Aeneas Seneca Translated by Frank Justice Miller